Thank you. As, yes, I am Eric Shepard. I work at Guild Group. Um, for those of you who don't know what Guild is, it's G with, uh, or it's Guild with an I, not with a UI. And um, Guild is a flash sales site. We do sales that run every day with 60% off of designer merchandise. Uh, clothing for men, women, and kids, home furnishings, uh, food, wine, city deals, the occasional car. And I lead the UI architecture team at Gilt. I've been there about three years. About a year and a half ago, we rebuilt our front-end infrastructure from the ground up. Uh, we went from having an extremely monolithic assets repository, some of you might know what that's like, um, to having a set of distributed repositories, all of which publish modules into a shared NPM registry. Um, so my team is responsible for the command line build tools that allow you to create a new module to run tests on it, to run lint on it, to run code coverage, and to publish it to the NPM registry, and also then to pull it into a web application. Uh, we're also the main committers for the core front end libraries that are shared across the Gilt web stack. <coughs> Gilt sits in this interesting place somewhere between a startup and a more established large company. Uh, we were a startup in 2007, but we have over 1,000 employees and hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. So we're moving further and further away from the, the startup label at this point. Um, but we do try to create a startup culture in our tech organization. Um, so our teams are three to eight person cross-functional teams. Our web stack is comprised of a lot of small web applications. We have lots of small services. Um, most of our code is in Scala on the Play framework. Um, so we have a lot of... Uh, ownership of code, a lot of rapid iteration on code, and it's a very exciting place to work. And I'm telling you this not because I'm a recruiter and because Gilt is great, because it is and we're hiring, but, uh, but I also want to say that becoming a large company does not mean that you need to become stuffy. It doesn't mean that you need to become enterprisey or that you need to build monolithic applications or that you need to have 10 layers of sign off before anything goes to production. We don't do any of those things at Gilt. But becoming a large organization does change the way that you make software. And I'm going to talk about that change today, especially as it relates to the use of third-party code. So eventually, we all get to a problem that we don't want to solve ourselves. And that's where third-party code comes in. jQuery is a great example of that. Um, and when you're a startup, you can do things like find a script, put a script tag in your page, and push the big red deploy button and you've solved your problem. But as you become a larger organization, your priorities shift from thinking in terms of days and weeks for code to thinking in terms of months and years. You're responsible for cultivating a code base over a long period of time. So some of the habits that you may have had as a startup, you can't necessarily carry over into being a large company. So I'm going to talk about how, at Gilt, we bring third-party code into our systems. And I'm going to talk about it by talking about time. So time is actually very important to us at Gilt. As I said, we're a flash sale site. So our sales run anywhere from 36 hours to several days. We've had sales as short as five minutes. Um, time is something that we need to do well. For example, when a sale starts, we need to build a lot of excitement around the start of a sale. And then we also need to create urgency as a sale is nearing its end. And then actually, as a sale is running, when you put something into your cart, what you have is a reservation for a SKU for a period of 10 minutes. Um, and after that 10 minutes is up, someone could take that SKU out from under you. And so we need to actually communicate by means of a timer counting down in the cart how much time is remaining on your reservation before you might lose that product. So time is extremely important to us, but it's also not something that we wanted to reinvent ourselves. We didn't want to build time and date and duration utilities from scratch. One of the libraries that's out there that handles this stuff fairly well is a library called Moment.js. How many of you have heard of Moment.js? All right, great. Um, I'm going to pick on Moment.js a little bit today, but it's all in fun and love. Um, we did, in the end, uh, elect to use Moment.js. Um, so I'm going to talk about how we chose to use Moment.js, how we brought it into Gilt, and how we wrapped it in our own APIs to keep our own internal APIs consistent. When you're thinking about using third-party code, the first question you need to 
ask yourself is whether it's even right to use third-party code. It's not always the answer to your problem. And I've got all my bullets up here because I don't want to keep walking back and forth in my computer. So you're not going to get any like fragment animations from me today. Um, so the first question you need to ask yourself about using third-party code is, what does it do for me? And is the thing that it does for me worth the downside to having third-party code in my code base? Third-party code is not a silver bullet. As Rumpelstiltskin says, magic comes with a price. And any once fans in here? All right, that was for my wife. Um, so, so the price with third-party code is that you have a foreign body in your code base. You have a black box. And when the black box works, it's, it's wonderful. But when it doesn't, uh, there could be more difficulty in working with it. Um, you're going to have a harder time debugging something that you didn't write yourself. You don't understand how its inner workings work. It also isn't going to log things out in the same way that your internal code may log things. And if you do have to fix a bug in someone else's code that is living in your repository, um, fixing it can become risky because you could end up making a change to something and then blowing that change away later when you go to upgrade the library. Again, because it's not code that you own. So in the case of Moment.js, we determined that the trade-offs were worth it for us. Uh, Moment gives us actually several things out of the box. Uh, one of those is internationalization. We're doing a lot of shipping internationally and localizing at Gilt, and Moment has that kind of built into it. Um, so that was one of the benefits for us. There were several more. Um, the second question that you can ask yourself is, is the thing that I'm using third-party code, code for, is it core to my business? Um, if you're using someone else's code, you're not innovating, pretty much by definition. And that's pro that could be OK, but it could not be OK. And you need to think through the process of whether the third-party code is going to hold you back from innovating in some space that you want to be a leader in. For example, if you're trying to reinvent e-commerce, if that's your elevator pitch, um, you're going to have a hard time doing that with an OS Commerce site or a Zencart site. Am I dating myself, or are those things still around? I don't actually know. It's been a long time. Um, but that's not good. you're not going to be able to innovate when you're doing that. So you need to think through whether or not the thing you're using code for is something that's core. And for us at Guild, we didn't want to change the world with dates and times. Um, we just wanted to have code that behaved and did its job well that we could depend on. And finally, uh, make sure that if you're using code from another source that it's licensed in a way that you're able to use it. Make sure it's open source licensed or something else that, that gives you permission to use the code. Excuse me. I'm at the tail end of a cold, and I'm hoping I can get through this without a fit of coughing. So the second question you have to ask yourself when using third-party code is, are you going to put it directly into your system, and are you going to start interacting with its APIs from all over your stack? Or are you going to write a wrapper around it? And if you've read the name of the talk you're in, you know where I'm going with this. When I say a wrapper, what I mean is a piece of code that sits in between your implementation and the third-party code. It acts as a membrane that allows your implementation to speak to the wrapper rather than speaking to the third-party code directly. So when deciding whether you want to do that, because it does make your job slightly more difficult, um, the first question you need to ask yourself basically centers around whether the code you're using is good code. That's, first point is basically, is it good? Um, is it well maintained? Is it on GitHub? Is there a good community around it? If you submit a pull request, does it end up getting accepted by the author and put into the code so that you can feed back into the system and give back and also keep using the code project itself rather than having a fork that sort of diverges over a period of months and years to where it, it is really hard to go back to the original project? Does the code have a good test suite around it? Um, do you trust those tests? Do those tests test edge cases that may be similar to your edge cases? And finally, is the code well documented? Uh, when you use third-party code, if you're interacting with it directly, that project's documentation becomes your documentation. How many of you have written internal docs for jQuery? Didn't think so. Yeah, you, you go to api.jQuery.com, and it's good, and it's automated, and it's always up to date, and that's great. And so you can depend on that documentation being reliable. If you're using a third-party project on GitHub and the docs refer to a version that was two versions ago and there's these subtle differences, it becomes very difficult for the users in your company to interact with this code. 
secondly, does the code do everything that you need it to do? Um, you're using third-party code because you have a problem to solve. And that problem, by definition, is 100% of your needs. Well, it's actually not. It's 100% of what you think your needs are today. It's probably less than that, but it's, it's the best you've got. Uh, so you have these needs you need to meet. And if the third-party code only meets you 80% of the way there, you need a plan for how you're going to accommodate the other 20%. It's not going to go away as much as we sometimes hope that that happens. Um, so if the code has a plug-in architecture, for example, that's a great way to make up that additional 20%. You can write a plug-in. Your users can inter interact with it sort of in the same way that they would uh, the third-party code itself. If it doesn't, um, are you going to write another script that sort of lives alongside of it, which is complex? Or are you going to go in and modify line 487 and go make a change and then put this big old comment at the top of the file that says, I changed this line. Please don't delete. Um, that's a very risky way to work. Um, I know this because I've done it. And someday you're going to go and you're going to upgrade the library and think, this is great. I'm going to get the new version. And you're going to paste it into the file and forget that you made a change that was important. Um, so that sort of is, is a hard way to work. Um, in the case of Moment.js, it didn't do 100% of what we wanted it to do. So we started thinking in terms of possibly wrapping it, although it is also pluggable. So we could have gone kind of either way at this point. And then finally, what is the API style like of the third-party code that you're using? If it's very different from your internal code, it's going to add a layer of cognitive complexity every time someone interacts with it. If, for example, your native code in your company is all very jQuery-like, and when you create objects, you're actually interacting with factories that return instances, and you never, ever, ever, ever have the new keyword in your code, and then you depend on a piece of third-party code that requires new to be used to construct objects, um, you're going to break things. You're going to forget to use new, and, and stuff's not going to work. <coughs> So in the case of Moment.js, the API is actually very jQuery-like, and our internal code at Gilt is actually not very jQuery-like. So we started thinking maybe writing a wrapper is, is the best way to use this code. And yeah, I don't actually think you have a lot to lose, no matter what, in writing wrappers around code. Here's a simple example if you want to sort of see a visual of what I'm talking about in that last example. Um, if the third-party code is a function, a constructor that needs to have new called on it, you could then write a simple wrapper that simply acted as a factory that returned instances of that thing. And then your internal customers of your code can interact with it in the same way that they do everything else in the code base. So once you've decided to write a wrapper, how do you do it? Well, I'm going to talk about some of the areas that we looked at when writing a wrapper around Moment.js. But sort of the overall philosophy that I want to impress upon you is, is to free your mind um, in whatever way that speaks to you. Uh, so it's very tempting when writing a wrapper to just go in and start wrapping functions one to one, uh, very closely bound to the third party code. And that's not always your best option. It's probably best to step away from the third party code, put it on a back burner, and figure out what you actually want your API to look like for the problem you're trying to solve. Um, write that API, stub it out, see what it looks like. Remember that you are using the third-party code not necessarily for its API, but because it does a business logic-y thing that you need done. Um, and then when you're done with that, when you've got an API stubbed out, you can bring the third-party code back in, you can layer it underneath, and then the two can start having a dialogue with each other. And you're going to be in a healthier place than if you had just gone in and started wrapping functions one to one. So to help you free your mind, I'm going to talk about five areas that we looked at when wrapping Moment.js. The first one is, in fact, API pattern. I don't know why Chrome is doing this flashy, flashy thing. So sorry about that. Oh, yeah, so API pattern. It's my contention that our widespread use and adoption of jQuery, not jQuery itself, but of jQuery-like APIs in the front-end community is a form of Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> so jQuery is popular in a large part. It, it's a great library. It's also popular in a large part because of its API. It made a lot of things very easy and, and kind of 
allowed it to, to rise above other libraries at the time. But I think that that's led in some cases to people in the front end community adopting those patterns and ways of doing things without necessarily thinking through all of the ramifications of those patterns. For example, if I look at jQuery, um, here's just height and inner height. Now, these two things look very similar. Um, they're, we know jQuery, we know it's an overloaded getter setter. Um, they, they look like they should behave the same way. And in fact, they do. If I pass a number into height and inner height, both of these methods change the DOM. So they work, I guess. But if I go to the documentation and I look at the docs, the docs tell me that I'm not supposed to use inner height as a setter. The docs only document inner height as a getter. So because of this ambiguous getter setter thing, I'm left not knowing whether the documentation is right or whether uh, my looking at the DOM and seeing what it does is right. If I go on to the data API, we all love data. It's great. Um, so to get data, we use data. And to set data, we use data. But if we want to remove data, we have to call remove data. So you have three methods, all of which maybe should behave in sort of a similar way. But two of them look a certain way, and one of them looks a different way. So again, there's this ambiguity in the API that doesn't necessarily reflect um, the reality of the code. But finally, I'm relieved, and I get to the class API. Because if I want a class, if I want to mess with classes, I call add class, or I call remove class, or I call has class. And has class is obviously going to return a Boolean, because it asks a question. And you have to answer that question, and that's yes or no. So the API is very clear. But it's actually sort of an accident, because, of course, class is a reserved word in JavaScript. So it was impossible to use class as an overloaded getter setter. So through this happy accident of JavaScript reserved words, I, I think we've got the, the best of the core jQuery APIs. So I'm going to move on to, uh, to Moment.js now. If I look at Moment, Moment constructs a couple things. So just for uh, terminology right off the front, uh, Moment is a wrapper around time. And time is essentially just a number of milliseconds from an origin back in 1970. And a duration is a number of milliseconds that does not have an origin. So it's the concept of 10 minutes or 60 seconds. That's a duration. So moment is a wrapper around time. Duration is just milliseconds with no context. Those two things, to me, are conceptually living on the same plane of existence. They're, they're similar types of entities. One of them has an origin. One of them does not. But if I go to the moment API, moment adopts this jQuery-like system of having a single point of entry. In jQuery, it's the dollar or the jQuery object. In moment, it's the moment object. So here we have moment behaving as a factory that returns moment instances. But then it's also an object that contains a factory called duration that returns duration instances. So because of this single point of entry, we have code that appears to have a hierarchy. There, there's this unequal relationship that's implied when I read the code that is not necessarily reflective of reality, which is that a duration and a moment are, are kind of sibling entities. Moment also does this overloaded getter setter thing. And so in a, in a traditional language like, like, uh, like Java, I use scare quotes for Java, um, when you have an overload, you have potentially a lot of signatures. You have different means depending on what you need. So if you have a backend that has a dispatch method, what's happening is that method is dispatching to a view. So you could have five different method signatures depending on what you need. And then the dispatch, dispatch is a verb that ends up going down to a view. So you have one end, and you have many means. But in jQuery and jQuery-like APIs, that's sort of undone a little bit, because you actually have multiple means to multiple ends. The actual end you're going to changes based on what you pass into the method. So that means that the method isn't able to tell me what it does. It, it has to sort of give me this abstracted noun of what it does, rather than give me a verb that tells me what I'm actually doing. Um, that leads to sort of the interesting effect of, of the fact that if you try to set something that ended up getting undefined somehow, uh, you've actually called a getter and not a setter. So you think you're setting something, but you actually aren't. And there's actually no way to know that anything went wrong in this code example. You can't log an error. You can't trace it very well, because the code behaved as it was supposed to. So 
when we wrapped moment.js, we wanted to write explicit getters and setters, and we also wanted to equalize moment and duration and put them at the same level. I also want to mention that all of these go both ways. I, I'm advocating a point of view, but either way, if you have internal code that is very jQuery-like and you're pulling in code that is not, then it probably is a good idea for you to wrap it to behave in the same way that jQuery behaves. The second thing I'm going to talk about is the concept of mutability. So mutability refers to an object's ability to be changed after it's created. If code, if code is either, an object that is created is either mutable or immutable. And you may disagree with the author of the third party code you're using as to what should be mutable and what should be immutable. And the wrapper is your opportunity to right those wrongs. So in moment.js, um, there's this concept called UTC. You're all probably familiar with time. Time is usually in local time because users' browsers are in local time. But the docs of Moment tell me that UTC is an interesting feature of Moment. And, and it is an interesting feature. But what it does is it actually transforms the moment. It actually mutates the moment into a different form. It's now a UTC moment. So if you have, in this example, if you have a number of functions in a queue and they have access to this moment, one of those functions could need the time in UTC format. It could need to know for maybe an analytics package or something like that. It could need it in, in UTC time. And it has to then call UTC to convert this moment into a UTC moment before it gets the time. And what that means is everyone down the food chain of that function queue is going to now have the wrong time, because they don't know that the moment has been mutated into a UTC moment. So when we built our wrapper, we wanted to hide this functionality. We wanted to make sure that all moments were in local time. And there's an explicit getter if you actually want to get a time in UTC format. Going the other way around, I mentioned that we wanted to treat moments and durations as sort of similar entities. In moment.js, the moment itself is mutable, and the duration is not mutable. And so that sort of adds an asymmetry that we wanted to take care of. So we wrote explicit setters for um, duration uh, minutes and seconds and hours. And those are actually fine because they say that you are setting. It's not like UTC where you have this accidental behavior where you could be mutating a moment without knowing that you're doing it. Um, if you call set hours on a time, it's pretty obvious that you want to change the hours. It's also the default behavior of JavaScript dates as well. So we have sort of a tense relationship with standards bodies as a front-end community, and not always with, without reason. So that said, standards bodies actually do work that's probably going to outlive my code and maybe some of your code as well. And if you have the opportunity to implement a standard in your code, it's probably a good idea to do that. So in moment.js, um, it implements half of the wonderful ISO 8601 specification. It's good reading. I recommend it. Um, ISO 8601 is the sort of token MMDD format. I'm sure you've seen dates. Um, and if you pass in a moment that is in that format, 2013-06-14, uh, it's going to construct that into a date. It has support for that. So we wanted to keep that. That's great. It also has sort of this behavior where you can pass an arbitrary date string in with an arbitrary format. And as long as you pass both of those in, it will link those two up and it will parse out whatever you give it. Um, that's the kind of behavior that, that seems like a good idea at the time, but for us, we, didn't, we thought it was more complexity than we wanted. Um, so we've actually hidden that functionality so that we only support ISO 8601 currently. However, let's talk about durations. So this is the moment duration constructor. And I'm not actually sure. Maybe the top one came first, and then there was a need to actually set 35 years and eight hours. So the bottom one actually is also available to you. And that one's easier to read um, than the top one. But it actually doesn't matter which one's easier to read, because there's a specification for durations. And it's actually the flip side of ISO 8601. It specifies durations. And so we wanted, when making a wrapper, to support the standard rather than to support moment.js's syntax. 
Um, it's, it's nice. It's easy to read. Uh, P stands for period. T stands for time. Um, you can probably figure out the rest. And then finally, uh, MomentJS doesn't just do this construction of things. We also need to see those things at a certain point. We need to display them to customers. So uh, there's a formatting specification called LDML. I think it stands for Locale Data Markup Language. And it's a cool spec, and, um, and MomentJS comes really, really close to full support for it. So the documentation for Moment actually links to a Google spreadsheet that tells you the differences between LDML and MomentJS. And so we didn't want to link to a Google spreadsheet. Uh, we just wanted to support LDML completely. So we wrote sort of a middle tier in between so that we had support for that. And you can see at the bottom that the, the differences are actually very few. They're, they're mainly upper and lower case and uh, a few day tokens. So there's a couple benefits to supporting standards. Uh, one of them is that you can share tokens between the client and the server. If you have a Java system that speaks LDML, it can just pass a formatting string down into the client, and the client can format it. And the other benefit is that the standard then can act as supplementary documentation. You can document your APIs, but then you can also link through and say, check out the LDML spec and, and see more, because that spec is, is going to have a lot of examples and, and you know, different permutations of the code. Um, so that's helpful. I've alluded to feature set already, but writing a wrapper is your opportunity to curate the set of features that you want to have in your code. It's your chance to pick what you don't want, and then also to add in the things that you do want. And in MomentJS, there were several things that we just don't need at this point. So we didn't wrap 100% of the functionality of Moment. We left quite a few things out. We may add those later on in the same or a different module if we have the need to do so. The functionality is, is blatantly there beneath the surface. We just haven't exposed it. But then we also wanted to add a couple things. One of those things is that duration formatting is incomplete. Um, you can't actually represent 10 minutes as 10 colon 0, 0. You can format times that way, but you can't format durations that way. Uh, so we wrote a formatter in between to add that support. But more interesting than duration formatting, which is really pretty simple, is that we wanted to support ICU message format. Anyone familiar with ICU message format? Really? It's not a lot of hands. You should check it out. It's pretty good. Um, so we're doing a lot of internationalization at Gilt. We're shipping to a lot of countries. We're, we're localizing to several languages. And oftentimes, when you localize things to other languages, they sort of get the short end of the stick. And, and things aren't necessarily natural to that language in terms of plurals and genders and the other sort of things that vary when you, when you localize things. So ICU message format, I know that the syntax looks a little freaky, but it's, it's actually awesome. Uh, Alex Sexton has done a great job with both writing about ICU message format and then also um, contributing a library called message format JS to the community. Uh, when I post my slides, I will add some links to these things. They're not there right now, but you can't see my slides right now, so it's okay. Um, I'll add that in, uh, because it's well worth a read. Uh, he explains why to use it, where it came from, and, uh, and then also you can use message format JS. So we were able to actually wrap not only moment JS, but we were also able to wrap message format JS. And our customers don't actually, our customers, code customers, our, our u end users, I don't know. The people that use our code don't need to care whether they're interacting with moment JS under the hood or whether they're interacting with message format JS under the hood. It's just another formatter. And it lets us do much more interesting things with formatting. The last thing I'm going to talk about that you want to consider when writing a wrapper is conflation. And conflation usually implies two things that are together but maybe shouldn't be together. So Moment does a couple things. In a big picture, it does two things. It does construction and math with dates and durations. That's kind of one thing, because they're all kind of tied together. And then it also does formatting. And so for Moment.js, those two things actually go together. Not too many people want to use a library that would let you do all sorts of amazing date computations, but then never let you see it. That's not, I mean, obviously, it would not be a successful project, and nobody would have heard of it if, if that's what it did. 
But formatting doesn't necessarily go with date construction in a larger code base. There are many reasons to want to format things without actually constructing and doing math on durations. JavaScript dates are native to the browser. You could want to format a JavaScript date directly. So splitting these two things out actually allows us to just format things without going through the moment system if that's what we want to do. I think I just talked about all my slides. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. So it's not exactly the single responsibility principle, but it's in the neighborhood of the single responsibility principle, and also was pointed out by the last talk in here um, that a module should do one thing and do it well. And yeah, so, so we built two modules that each do one thing well. And if you're interested in, yeah, I've got, I've got time. So uh, what we actually built then is a stack that consists of four modules and eight files to encapsulate our date and duration formatting, so, or um, management. So the first thing is the third party code, and that again is moment.js and message format.js. Moment does construction of instances, it does math, and it does maybe a third of our formatting. And then message format.js does another bit of formatting for us in ICU. And then we have the lovingly named common date utils, which is sort of the wrapper around that construction and instance management stuff. And so that does construction of moments, which will take either a JavaScript date or milliseconds, or the bottom is a uh, ISO 8601 date string. And then it will also let you create durations, which will take both milliseconds and ISO 8601 durations. So those two things both live at the same level of hierarchy. And then we have a formatter module. And so we already had a pre-existing base formatter at Gilt uh, that all formatters inherited from prior to building this module. So it made sense for us to build our date formatter as a, a, a inheriting from the, the parent base formatter. Because it's a module, uh, it, has several, it can have as many files as you want in it, and it has five files in it. And one of them formats moments using LDML. And this, again, is full LDML support with the addition of moment.js's tokens. That LL thing in the second example is actually a, a lookup to what becomes a locale file for international users. So we can actually um, have a whole set of, of locale files so that we don't have to put the actual format in the code. Otherwise, you can pass in the format string as well. We also then can format durations the way that we wanted to, this part we wrote ourselves. And then we can actually pass through to moment.js's calendar function, which shows us stuff like Wednesday at 4.30. Um, I, I don't remember if we actually use that or not, but it's there. And then uh, we can also do the, the human readable duration format. This is just a simple pass through to moment.js because it does this really well. And then lastly, we have a formatter that does the ICU message format. And there's an example. So to sum up, we wrote wrappers around moment and message format. The first thing we looked at was the API style itself. It did things in a very jQuery-like way. We wanted to have things be consistent with the rest of the guilt.com code base. So we brought moment and duration to the same conceptual level and we added explicit getters, setters, rather than using the overload. We also looked at mutation. We wanted to not have the situation where UTC could just mutate a moment. So we hid that. We made sure that moments stayed local. Um, and we also added the ability to mutate a duration so that you could pass, or so that you could call set hours on a duration and, and um, change it. So yes, standard compliance. There are two great standards for dates and durations. They are ISO 8601 and LDML. So we are not in full compliance. There's a difference between being in full compliance and being in partial compliance and actually conflicting with a standard. So what you don't want to do is conflict with a standard. You don't want to have two tokens that differ from a standard. But you don't need to implement 100% of it. You need to implement the subset of it that you need. So we don't have 100% LDML compliance but we could add any tokens in the future that we needed to and not come into conflict with the specification. We also, if I didn't say it, added support for ISO 8601 durations, so the durations are constructed through the standard rather than um, 
through MomentJS's somewhat arbitrary API. Fourth, we looked at feature set. Writing a wrapper means you only have to wrap the things that you need, that you want to support in your code base and that you have a business need for. So we selected what we wanted, and then we also added in support for duration formatting and for ICU message formatting using the wonderful messageformat.js. And finally, because a module should do one thing and do it well, we split the functionality into two separate modules, a utility that does construction and math. That math being you can add a duration to a moment. If I want to take three days from this time, that's what I mean by math. Um, so you can do all the inner workings of adding and subtracting and diffing durations and moments, and then a formatter module that allows you to display things in whatever way you need to the user. And should we have other needs for that in the future, we can continue to add to that module um, if we need to format things differently. So through all of this, we were able to take advantage of what is really good code out there in the ecosystem. I know I've picked on MomentJS a little bit, but it's good, and we like it. So we were able to take advantage of that, but we were also able to bring it in line with the code that we have at Gilt so that users in our company can interact with it in the same way that they do the other code that we have. So I'm happy to take any questions. Do, are you going to run around with the? OK. Did you find a need for? I, I don't know if this, yeah. Did you find a need for uh, time zone uh, uh, functionality? Because I, I know that Moment did not have it, and they are working on it. But uh, you know we have uh, reasons for use, uh, showing to the user central time, for example. Okay. Even though you know they are in some other time zone, we actually do have that need, and I don't remember offhand what we did for it. We have solved that because we have promos, for example, that end at 12 Eastern or midnight Eastern, and we've needed to communicate that. But off the top of my head, I don't remember what we did. Uh, we, we use time, time zone JS, which is a okay. library for that. But I don't know if you have wrappers around it. Yeah, we don't. We don't have that. I can't remember. We might have solved that with uh, getting a time from a server. I, I can't recall right now. <laughs> um, do you find, <clears throat> now that you're wrapping and adding all this extended uh, functionality into it, um, that you have a harder time contributing back in, or does, does your model support still taking the new features and the, and the extra LDML support and things like that, and having a path for easily contributing it back in? Yeah, so we actually have not tried to contribute back into Moment except for docs. The docs were out of date, and we, we submitted a pull request for, for documentation. Um, yeah, we have not tried to do that. We are, um, yeah, I, there is something that we have contributed back to, and we've done a lot of that in the server side of things, but not with Moment. Am I on? Hey. There I'm wondering are. if uh, using MomentJS, if you have any functionality in there, if uh, today were your birthday. I'm sorry? If today were your birthday, would there be any uh, functionality in MomentJS to uh, handle that adequately? No, I think, I think that's a pull request I'm working on. It's not, it's not there yet. It's an oversight. It's I, a, I, there's, a, there's a ticket. It's Eric's birthday. Yeah. So uh. happy birthday, Eric. Everybody clap. <laughs> <laughs>